Hi, I'm Jim Olgensky, Principal Database en Engineer at AWS. Today we're going to talk, do a deep dive on Postgres on RDS. Postgres is a really vast uh, and, and, and deep technology, so we can't really do a, a deep dive across the entire engine in the amount of time in a, a short presentation. So we're really going to focus on a couple key areas, primarily around performance. But a bit about RDS. RDS is a managed relational database service, and there you have a choice of your engines. It could be a one of the commercial engines, Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle, one of the open source engines like MySQL, MariaDB, or what we'll talk about today, Postgres, or Aurora. But regardless of which engine you choose, you have all the same basic tenants. They're easy to administer. They're there for durability and high availability. You're not gonna lose any data. You, you wanna be able to scale and perform inside your database, while at the same time give you the security need for your compliance in your organization. But why Postgres? Postgres has been around for over 30 years, it started back in 1986, and it truly is an open source project. It's not controlled by a single company, but by the community itself. And it's gained popularity over the last several years, primarily for its ability to have performance and scalability that match what you get out of the commercial engines, whether it's different index types, have partitions for large data databases, or a various number of other things that we'll talk about today. But with Postgres, you have, uh, when you're looking at it in RDS, you're getting the, the code that you get out of the Postgres community from postgres.org. And you have all the major versions from 9.5 up to 12. But keep in mind that 9.5 is reaching into life soon, right? It will, the community's last release will be in February and it'll be deprecated on RDS shortly around that time. But also their new versions are available too. So Postgres 13 is available in preview today and it'll be GA soon. Aurora, if you have other throughput needs or high availability needs, allows you to be able to take Postgres to the next level. It's available in Postgres 9, 6, 10, and 11. But with the, this, the storage engine dedicated for Aurora, um, it's really tailored towards relational databases like Postgres and MySQL. It gives you higher availability across three availability zones, while at the same time giving you better throughput uh, than, the, the, than the open source engines. This allows you to hit scales that you see in the commercial engines themselves, um, but we'll, we'll leave that for another talk. Today, we're really gonna focus on RDS Postgres. So when you wanna deploy Postgres on RDS, you have a few choices to make in the beginning. One is on your instance types. Depending on your workload, you're gonna choose between a T, an M, or an R. If your application has very burstable workloads where there's periods of the day where you may go down to no activity or very little activity, a T class might be uh, the right choice for you, right? So this way you could handle the, the burstability in it. But if you have fairly consistent day, uh, transactions throughout the day, you may choose an M or an R type. When you're choosing between the two, R has more RAM per CPU than the M does, right? So depending on your database sizes, the more you'd wanna be able to fit in cache, the better for better performance, you may choose an R over an M in order to be able to get the, the more memory um, per CPU. Where in, with an R, you could go up to 96 vCPUs and 768 gigabytes of RAM. But also with those M and the R, there's a, a new generation, the M6G and the R6G. Those leverage the Graviton 2 chips, which are 64-bit ARM processors. These give you better price performance um, for their, their M5 equivalents. And, and this way you're able to take advantage of the faster CPU speeds or faster CPU uh, scalability um, with just being able to upgrade your instances or even replicate to them. Right? The other thing to keep in mind is these scale down to a single vCPU. So you may, you, you'll be able to take advantage of the price performance even on the low end in your dev test or if you just have a smaller application. But when you're talking about databases, you need storage. Databases are all about storing data. You need to be able to choose your type of storage. Again, if you have a T class instance, you may be more drawn towards the GP2 type of uh, storage. That too handles burstable workloads. So if you have the periods of time with very little activity, it may be the right choice. Whereas if you have more of a consistency and you, uh, throughout the day and you need consistent performance all, at all times, 
you may choose provisioned IOPS. But regardless of which one you choose, they both auto scale up to 64 terabytes. Regardless of which type of instance you choose or which type of storage you choose, you need high availability and, and it's available to you with the multi-AZ option. And with multi-AZ, everything is synchronously replicated from your primary instance to a secondary standby in a, sec a separate availability zone. So in the event that a, an instance goes down, what will happen is the standby will be promoted to the new primary. And, the, and a, a new standby will be created uh, in the old availability zone. So this way, you never lose data during that failover time. And what happens along the way is your applications will find the new IP address from, from the DNS and reconnect to the new primary. So this way, you're able to have seamless failovers uh, in the event of any sort of issues uh, with your database instance itself. But that takes time. In order to detect the failover and do go through crash recovery as things go along. And when you fail over, what happens is you're failing over to a new instance, or even if you just restarted your database instance, what you're getting is a cold cache after things start back up again. So while the failover time happens very quickly, even around about a minute or so, in, in this particular graph in about 70 seconds, what happens is it takes nearly four and a half minutes before you're able to get back to the transaction load that you were before. So if you notice before the failover time that happened at about 10 minutes, we were doing between 60 and 70,000 transactions per second on this PG bench workload. And it took nearly 264, 264 seconds in order to be able to get back to where we were um, at the 60 to 70,000 transactions per second takes a long time. So while your, your database is responding fairly quickly, you're not getting back to the application performance that you had before the failover event. Luckily, Postgres has a way to help with that. So there is an extension called PG Prewarm. PG Prewarm has always been there. It's been around an extension for a, a long time, but it used to be that you could just do it through manual loads of your indexes, your tables into cache. But starting in Postgres 11, there's auto pre warm which gives you a background worker that will automatically be able to restore your cache in the event of a restart for the database in any particular reason. So that background worker will live on the primary and periodically it'll wake up and produce a file. That file is really just references of what's in your cache inside your shared buffers at that given point in time. And that file is then pushed into storage. And because of multi-AZ, the synchronous storage out to the secondary, that same file is pushed out to the standby. So in the event of a failover, the, as a new primary comes, starts back up, that background worker is started again. And it'll pull the file off of the, the storage that has been replicated over and repopulate the cache of how it was before the failover event. And that gives us this results here. As you can see in the pink, this is with PG Prewarm on. So now things are coming along and starting up in about 30 seconds after the failover event, giving you back the performance you had um, prior to the failover event. So instead of taking three and a half minutes to, in order to be able to get back to the performance numbers we have, now we're coming back in about 30 seconds after that. Big performance difference to your application, getting back to the, uh, getting back to the performance levels you had prior to the event that happened. Another way that in order to handle failover events, in order to get application performance back to how it was before is around connections. I've seen a number of applications out there that create thousands of database connections, right? Around Postgres doesn't handle it nearly as well, right? So any sort of system, whenever you're doing performance testing, there's always a knee in the curve of where as you throw in more work, things start getting um, less performant. In Postgres, that range of connections is usually in the one to 300 connection range. Right? And it really depends on your workload, your system, and a number of other things, but it's in the low hundreds, not the low thousands. Right? Uh, but I see a number of applications that have it in the low thousands. So in a, when a failover happens, you have to reconnect all those thousands of connections in order for your application to perform normally. So really we want to be able to limit those number of connections so it can fail over faster, but also be at that, that sweet spot of the top of the graph to have the peak, peak throughput. RDS proxy helps you do that. It is a fully managed database proxy that allows for connection pooling 
and this way you could funnel your connections from the thousands of connections that you want to, your application server wants to create to the database through database proxy to the database in order to funnel things down to stay near the top of that curve. So it works simply by sitting between your database server and your application server, and it handles those connections. So the event of a, a database restart in any sort of way, your, your pro, RDS proxy will hold on to those application connections. Um, so this way you're not losing those connections and you don't have to reestablish them from the application side. But when you're talking about performance, when we look at that, that knee in the curve, that peak point, Everybody wants to be able to make that peak point higher or shift it to the right um, or, or move it in some sort of way. So the natural thing is to go find those magic parameters in order to make things go faster. Right? At, with RDS, with the default parameter groups, we've already tuned things in order to be able to give you the best performance you can without sacrificing durability or security on your application. Right? But, but people want to still make things go a bit faster and you can fine tune things for your application. But when you search around things on the internet for performance tuning Postgres, the first thing you're going to find is random page cost. If you want to be able to set that, um, you can set that in your parameter group. And what I see a lot of people do is setting that to a value of one. Right? If you search around, make set random page cost to one, makes things go faster. In this example here, running PG Bench, setting random page cost to one, makes no material difference. Right? That really comes down to what the nature of random page cost is. Random page cost is, uh, makes the, the cost of your indexes less expensive from an optimizer standpoint. So this way the optimizer will fa favor uh, using indexes. That really only affects query plans that are near their teetering on the edge of between a sequential scan and an index scan. So if you're out, your queries are clearly an index scan or clearly a sequential scan, random page cost really will make no material difference. Next one people look at is effective page cache, effective cache size. Effective cache size, we set that really big to something like one terabyte. What we're doing is telling the optimizer that really all of our indexes are gonna be in cache. Again, making those indexes less expensive in order to favor those index scans. As you can see here again for PG Bench, setting that to a really high number makes no material difference on your performance. Just like random page cost, it only affects those plans that are on that edge between different plants. But there is an option that can make things go faster. Max wall size. By default, we set that to two gigabytes. You could set that higher. In this example here, I set that to 20 gigabytes. And we see a material difference on the performance. You get better throughput by setting that higher. That makes your transaction log size bigger. But that performance comes at a cost. Back when we, we measured that failover time of 70 seconds, when you set max wall size higher, you have more walls to go through when you have crash recovery. So you're gonna sacrifice availability because tr crash recovery time will take longer for performance. That's a business decision you'd have to make of if that's the right trade for you. Can you sacrifice longer failover times or longer restart times for the better performance? But besides the parameters, another way to make things perform better is by doing less work. And by doing less work, that could be doing things like index scans. And you get that by having smaller, more compact indexes. Right? The smaller your index is, the, the less it has to traverse down the B tree. And also, the smaller they are, the more they'll fit in cache, or potentially more indexes could fit into cache. So here we could see an example of looking at a couple of indexes across Postgres versions. This is the, the, the accounts table from PG Bench. So it's the same thing, I just added a second index on B, the column BID, the branch ID. So this way we could look at two, two different types of indexes, a primary keyword, it's unique, and the branch ID, which has duplicates. And you can see across the different versions, Postgres 11, 12, and 13, the index sizes are, 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 are the same. There's no change. But for Postgres 12 versus Postgres 11 for the branch ID index, it's 26% smaller. This is an optimization in Postgres 12 in order to be able to handle duplicate, uh, duplicate entries and how it handles page splits. So as you're adding more rows to the index, 
Previously, it would split in the middle of the page and, and create a balanced tree. Now what it does is it creates it so this way it's, it feels as though it's a right-leaning tree because of all the duplicates, so it'll split more towards the right side of the page, allowing you to have a completely full page and the other one relatively empty as you're adding more things in, which is a more efficient use of space for those duplicate rows. But in Postgres 13, there's even a further optimization to handle those duplicates even better in order to dedupe some of those. Right. That gives us 77% performance uh, space savings on your index. That directly translates into better performance for your application. That 77% means that your entire index was more likely to fit in, in cache, depending on, the, again, your instance size and how much RAM you have, but also it has a, a lot less work to do in order to be able to scan that index. So what happens if we make some changes to the, that application, right, and make some changes to that table? So if we went ahead and updated that table, right, and here we just backfilled it of just setting the filler column to the string reinvent across all the rows. Right? Here we could see Postgres multi-version concurrency control come into play. In Postgres, whenever you do an update, everything is really creating a new version of a row in the index. So even though it's a primary key, there will be duplicate entries of each primary key entry in the index itself, but with different versions. Right? And that's where you can still get that deduplication tech, uh, optimization in Postgres 13. So even your primary keys, when you're using updates in your application, it's going to, in this particular case, it was 33% smaller uh, in Postgres 13 over Postgres 11 and 12. But the vast majority of your performance tuning doesn't necessarily come from finding a parameter or just improvements in the engine itself. It really comes down to optimizations for particular queries. And you find that by monitoring and finding where slow points in your application. RDS provides a few areas to, to be able to pinpoint that. You may be using enhanced monitoring or CloudWatch or Performance Insights in order to track it down. But a lot of the applications that need to be tuned are coming over from a migration from one of the uh, commercial engines. Those tend to have a lot of storage procedure code, and, and there's complex logic buried in there, which tends to be fairly CPU intensive. Or you may have another type of application doing some ge geospatial ne nearest neighbor searches, or some full text searching, which uses a lot of CPU. For the next several slides, I use an example of some really complicated business logic, yeah, doing the Fibonacci of a number. Right? That does stress the CPU in order to be able to calculate the Fibonacci of, of a, a series of numbers, uh, doesn't really have much business sense to it uh, for most applications, but it is a good example. And here on the right is an example of that Fibonacci function. When I run that as a series, I could stress the CPU. So running it on a, uh, a eight CPU machine on a M5 two extra large, we could see the, the performance graph of that, of just generate, repeatedly running the Fibonacci function over and over again. And we could see a sharp, uh, a sharp change in the graph trajectory at four CPUs, right? where it goes up fairly sharply after it starts using four CPUs. Compare that to the M6G on the Graviton. It's a lot more steady, and all the way up to, to eight uh, vCPUs where everything is fully utilized. And at that point, the Graviton instance, the M6G over the M5, is has a 30% performance advantage over the M5, right? Just more efficient use of scaling the, the CPU using the Graviton processor. Right? But we want to dig down and really figure out what's happening. Why is it sucking up all the CPU? Next place we look is Performance Insights. All that green on the graph is just CPU, right? Performance Insights lets us look at the SQL, and no surprise, we have it uh, we're running our fib function from a generate series. You know, in this particular example, it's going from the numbers one to 35. So we're generating a lot of, a lot of Fibonacci sequences. So digging down in that, there's another extension called pgprocTab that gives us even deeper visibility into what's running on the system. pgprocTab creates a set returning function that exposes system level metri metrics through SQL. And that allows us to join it to other things inside the database like PGSAT activity in order to produce the results we have below here. So you can join each individual, see what each individual query is using from user time, uh, user time on the CPU versus system, 
or even the read and write to storage. Here we can see all the Fibonacci's using a lot of uh, user CPU uh, time. Um, and the check pointer is, has a lot of writes, as you would expect. Right? So you could even see the background process as we're using Proctab. Right? But we really want to dig down into that. We, everything's saying that Fibonacci is the problem, right? that Fibonacci function. But it's a fairly simple function. What could be the problem? There's another extension called P, PL Profiler that helps us dig into that. Um, it allows us to expose each individual line inside of the stored procedures and get back uh, at timing and execution count numbers on each individual line. You could use that by putting that into your shared preload libraries parameter and then creating the extension PL Profiler. Then what we need to do is set uh, enable local to true, so this way we're gathering everything in our local session, right? and set our, our interval to zero, so this way things start gathering immediately. Then we run our function, run fib of 35. Right? And let's, when that's done, it allows us to go look in to see what's going on inside of that function. So that too produces another set returning function called line stats local. And when we join that to PG proc, which has all the uh, line information for or the source code information for each individual stored procedure, we get what we see there on the right, where for each individual line inside of that stored procedure, we get the total execution count and the total time run. So just running FIBA 35, we could see that return statement is run 14.9 million times. That's the power of recursion. Right? And all that the numbers on the right total time is in microseconds. So the FIBA 35 really took 2,184 seconds, <laughs> really long time to run a, a fairly simple uh, function. Right? So it really comes down to that function not being written properly for the strength of the engine of Postgres. Postgres isn't very good uh, at handling recursion like that, not being able to recurse itself 14.9 million times. Right? So let's make it more optimized for Postgres and write it as a for loop. Take that same function, do it as a for loop, and here we can see through PL Profiler that inside that for loop, as we'd expect, it only goes through 34 times. It goes much faster at 77 microseconds. Right? So sometimes performance tuning isn't a parameter or uh, an improvement in the engine itself. Sometimes you need to rewrite some code. And PL Profiler will help you narrow down where inside your stored procedure code you need to focus on rewriting. But how do we get all these new features and functionalities. Right? So sometimes as you do major version upgrades, you get the things in PG-13. Sometimes in minor versions, we release new extensions. Right? But with minor versions, nothing in the core engine changes. Right? Nothing's going to change as far as the system catalogs or data types or anything like that. That's all the same. It's just the binaries that are changed. Sometimes new functionality is released as an extension, but nothing in the core engine itself major versions, things change a lot more. So as you'd expect, the minor version upgrades are fairly simple. Database is shut down, the binaries are replaced, and you start the database back up again. That usually ha happens in a couple minutes. Really depends on what's happening on the database at the time. And that could be done automatically or manually based on your choice. So if it was automatic, you may have auto mi minor version upgrades enabled. So whenever we mark a, a new minor version as preferred, the next maintenance window, you're going to get the new minor versions for the major version that you're on. Major versions are a bit more. So under the covers from the community, we're using PG Upgrade. It allows you to be able to do things like jump major versions. So we could go for it right from Postgres 9.5, which is being deprecated, right up to Postgres 12, um, or anywhere in between. But really, the time there is dependent on your schema, right? because all the individual tables need to be mapped as they're going on. So it does mean that a, a 50 terabyte database with 100 tables upgrades faster than a 100 gigabyte database with a million tables. So test it for what, how long it's going to take for your given application and your schema takes to do major version upgrades, because it is very variable based on your schema. Right? But keep in mind that you need to gather statistics. PG Upgrade does not run, uh, upgrade your statistics. So that has to be done after you do your major version upgrade in order to get the statistics for the optimizer. Also, remember to create a new parameter group. The parameter groups are not upgraded. 
this is something that you should have a new parameter group set while you're doing your testing for the new major version. And if that your database has read replicas while you're doing the major version, if those replicas are in the same region, they're going to be upgraded along the way. So the replicas after the primary is done, though each of the replicas within the same region will be upgraded as well. If it's a cross-region replica, those won't be upgraded. You'll need to do that separately by recreating new cross-region replicas. They'll just be disconnected. So if you want to prevent your read replicas from being upgraded in region, you need to promote them so this way they get, separ they get separated from the primary before you do the major version upgrade. Sometimes you need to be able to upgrade your snapshots. So for some organizations, they have, have requirements in order to be able to hold on to backups for years something like seven years. Uh, when you're doing that, major versions get deprecated along the way. 9.5 is uh, about five years old now, um, but if you have a seven-year window in order to hold on to your backups, you need to be able to restore them along the way. There, you have the ability to upgrade your snapshots. So this way, this is offline and just upgrade your snapshots that have been backed up. So you could upgrade them to whatever version that the production actually is at the time. So if you've over the years, you've upgraded from, you went from Postgres 9, 5 to 12, you could upgrade your snapshots along the way too. Some organizations may have requirements not to be able to touch those snapshots, so you could actually upgrade to copies of those snapshots in order to keep things there uh, for, for rapid uh, ability to restore them um, along the way while still complying with the don't touch the old backups um, that you need to keep around. But a lot of times for those backups, when you have to restore them out of uh, really old ones, you just need to get one or two tables or some other thing. So you really need to just move some data around. Right? You also have the ability to be able to pull out data out of your snapshots and push them directly into S3. Right? So that you have a functionality that off of any of your snapshots, not on your production running database, a snapshot that you took last night or last year, you're able to re restore that whole database or a subset of the database on the based on the tables to an S3 bucket in Parquet format. And with Parquet format, you could consume that with things like Athena or Redshift or some other tools. Other times, you need to be able to move data out of the S3, out of a, a live running database onto uh, S3, not from a snapshot. You need to be able to take it right, uh, right from the beginning. Right, uh, right from the live database. So there's an extension, AWS S3, that allows you to do that. It can take any sort of query and be able to put it into an S3 bucket. Right. So that S3 bucket um, has to be within the same region of where you're running your database instance itself. And the file output that gets put there is based on the copy syntax, the Postgres copy syntax that um, uses the copy command internally. So here you could set it to a CSV format. You could use other delimiters like tab delimited or pipe delimited, whatever really fits your needs based on the Postgres copy syntax. Other times you may need to load data from an S3 bucket. It too follows the same copy syntax. It's in the same AWS S3 extension, but here you're loading it into a specific table and you choose which columns you want to be able to be able to load in. Right? Again, uses the same copy format, right? So use the, the documentation for the, the Postgres copy command, and you can see what different formats you can be able to do that, of how you handle nulls and delimiters and, and strings and other sorts of things. It, it's fairly robust of what you can be able to do, could do. Other times you need to be able to move data between two different running Postgres databases. And that's where the Postgres foreign data wrapper comes into play creates links between different Postgres databases. And you could run select, insert, update, and delete across those links. And even more complex queries that might have aggregates and joins and other things, you can get pushed down to the remote server in order to be able to run things more efficiently and not pull potentially millions or billions of rows across the wire. Besides just connecting to other Postgres databases, you could connect to an Aurora Postgres writer or reader or you could connect to Redshift through the same Postgres FDW. In order to do that, first you create the extension Postgres FDW. 
and then you need to create a server. That could be anything you want, uh, anything that's meaningful to you. Right? In this particular case, we're calling it Redshift because we're going to connect to a Redshift database. And then we pass in the connection information for that database. Right? We get database name, the host, and the port. Finally, we need to create login information. So here we're going to create a user mapping for the current user that's running and map that to uh, the remote database user of DW user. So this way, whenever the current user that's running, the, the gym user, needs to be able to connect to Redshift, it will do, do so using the DW user or whatever your, your needs are for your particular organization. Then we need to create that foreign wrapper. So the first thing I tend to like to do is create a separate schema for all my foreign tables. It makes it easier to manage. Right. Then you need to create that foreign table. It follows along a lot like the create table syntax, but now you're adding the create foreign table. It also adds in some additional things in order to be able to map things along. One of it being uh, table remapping. Right? So your, your local column name may be different than what that remote table name may be. In this particular case, we're going to remap locally delta to the word amount on the remote Redshift database. And then we need to be able to put in the different option information of where we can we find that table on the remote database itself. So what schema is public, and it, the name of the table is transaction history. And once we do that, we're able to interact with it like a normal table. You know, here we could insert all uh, the PG Bench history table into the Redshift transaction history table through a simple select statement, right? or anything you want in order to be able to push the data into the, the main data warehouse. Right? Or we could select from it. And if you want to see what's the remote query that gets pushed along, you could run an explain verbose on the query that you're running locally. And what it does is it shows you the, what the remote query is going to be. So hopefully we, we dug into a few key pieces around performance and a few other features inside of Postgres uh, around upgrades and, and how you move data around in order to be able to make your, your whole application and architecture a little more scalable. If you want to find out more, there are some related sessions where you could do a deep dive on Post, Aurora Postgres or RDS in general. With that, Hopefully you, had, uh, you learned something about Postgres performance and a deep dive into RDS Postgres. Thank you, and please fill out your session survey.